This week, a little different show format. We're going to do some news. We're going to talk to Ed Scotus. Then we're going to do some news. So when we talk about news, we're going to be talking about CVEs and typos, Ask Your Art Rick Rolling, Skeletons in the Closet, Zero Days Are a Thing, I Heard You Like Zip Files, So I Put a Zip File in Your Zip File, Hacking VDIs and Steps in the Wrong Direction, Infotainment Hacking, Mazda, and File Names, Small Linux Kernel Patch with an Even Smaller Impact, Not So Reliable Wireless Backhaul, and Phones Are Rebooting. Ed Scotus will join us to talk about the Holiday Hack Challenge. Stay tuned, all that and more on this week's Paul Security Weekly. This is a Security Weekly production for security professionals by security professionals. Please visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to all the shows on our network. It's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. ThreatLocker implements a least privilege approach to cybersecurity, blocking every executable unless specifically authorized by your team. This methodology mitigates ransomware, supply chain attacks, and zero-day exploits and ensures protection for your organization 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. To learn more about how ThreatLocker can help prevent known and unknown threats in your digital environment, safeguard your data and operations from threat actors, and align your organization with respected compliance frameworks, visit securityweekly.com forward slash ThreatLocker. Coming to you from Purgatory Studios in semi-high definition, compliments of Darth Vader himself. This is Paul Security Weekly, episode number 851, being recorded on Wednesday, November 13th, 2024. Mr. Larry Pesce is to my left. What's up? What's up? Homie, how you doing? Doing good. Well, home skillet. I I am burning the candle at both ends and I've carved out a section of the middle and trying to light that on fire too. Right. Whew. <clears throat> yeah, it's been uh, it's been a week. It's been a week. It, it certainly has. Yeah, Mr. Jeff Mann is here with us. Hello, boys. Two weeks in a row. Is that right? Yeah, Two weeks in a row. I'm loving it. Loving it. I've, I've only got one more road trip this year, and that's the first week of December. So you got me for the duration. Mr. Bill Swearingen is here with us. Bill, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Uh, I, as as always, happy to be here. Who let Bill on? Yeah, I know. I'm back, baby. I'm back. Snuck his way in. Mr. Josh Marpet is here with us. Josh, welcome. I've been here for a couple of weeks, but it's really nice to be back. Let me tell you. Yes, I know. It is nice to have you back. You have not been here since you have not been here. Is there a particular news article or topic from this week, either in our show notes that you observed, Josh, that you would like, uh, to, like us to start off with? You know, I, I, I'm really curious about your zip file, zip file, zip file. Oh, yeah. Like, can I stop zip saying files, zip file? Zip files in zip files. Now, when I first saw this, I was like, wait a minute. Like, <laughs> yes. hold on. Did I just step into a time machine and go back to, and like, I, and LLMs couldn't answer the question. They, or Google, no one could answer the question. Well, no online thing could answer the question of when was the first like research published about a zip file inside of a zip file being used to evade detection? Because like in my mind, I date that back to like early 2000s. Yeah, like right. They, it has the feel of like 2003 to 2005 time frame. I right? mean, if you're not married to zip file, but just compressed files, I think we could go back to the 90s. Could we go yeah, back to I would... Unix systems with compressed files inside of compressed files? We could, couldn't we? If anybody Farballs. says the compilers compiling compilers, I'm just I'm done. Okay. <laughs> well, this is the. The compression, compressing the, the compressed files. Oh, dear God. Not the same thing. I don't want to say it's the same thing. But um, so anyway, I swear I've seen this before, like a lot. Um, however, so it's certainly not new. Obviously effective because still being used. Um, but in this case, it's interesting. <clears throat> the unpackers treat this differently. And the blog post. The blog post. Unpackers? The unpackers. Which unpackers would these be? Like WinRAR, 7-Zip. Okay. Or the one okay. built into Windows, which to my recollection. So the unpacking utilities. Yeah. Yeah. See, I, w- see, I was thinking like AV People. unpackers. No, sorry. Virus total the, unpackers. The compression utilities. utilities. Okay. Yeah. Was, okay. They call them unpackers in the article. I think that's why I was going unpacking. But, mm. um, and they all use different compression techniques. Yep. There was an episode where we had to go into detail on that. And it was absolutely fascinating. And then 
pretty quickly realized it had nothing to do with hacking or cybersecurity. It's just a pure computer science uh, thing at that point. Uh, but what I remember from that is like they all use different compression algorithms. Um, and from this article, <clears throat> they all obviously they have different code bases. They decompress things in different ways. Some of them pick up on the multi multi packed uh, concatenation, zip concatenation, I should call it. Uh, and some of them don't, and there's a lot of it depends in there. But what they found was that 7-zip did not catch one of the occurrences. So Perception Point, in this case, contacted the 7-zip developers to address specific behavior of concatenated zip files. The developer confirmed that it is not a bug and is not considered intentional functionality, meaning this behavior is unlikely to change, leaving the door open for attackers to continue exploiting zip concatenation for those users that are using 7-zip. I'm not sure if that's just a That's a, a mighty strange way of saying it's a feature. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well said. I don't have anything that more to add. That's beautiful, Jeff. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't, I don't quite understand the problem. So can you explain it a little bit more, anybody? Like, what's, what's the issue? So uh, Travis Goodspeed used to call this file format fuckery. <laughs> and I really liked that name. I'm not going to lie. And the if you F. look... If you look at the POC GTFO issues way back in the day, I think the first one, it was a, it was a PDF that if you, um, you could unzip it and it would turn into a, a, a zip file of a PDF of itself. And oh. effectively, there's, there's ways you can play with the headers and uh, ways you can play with the, the, the start of the file. So the, 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 the actual, what is this file? And then the actual first few bytes of a file. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to change how it reacts when, if you, if you perform operations on it, like unzipping a PDF file is technically possible. And if it's set up that way, it'll work. Okay. Not, not a zip of a PDF, an actual unzip of an actual PDF file. So the, uh, the, the idea here is that there's ways to add a zip file to a zip file, to a zip file, to a zip file that will, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but, mm -hmm. um, that will allow it to escape because, uh, a lot of, uh, unpackers only unpack one level or two levels. They don't unpack 17 levels deep or whatever it is. Yeah. And, and this and so one it, wasn't even so much about the, the multiple recursiveness. It was concatenating two zip files together into a oh. third zip file. <clears throat> You're right. Oh, I yeah, see. Yeah, this okay. is concatenation, yeah. not mm. zip bombs. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I confused. Thank you, Larry. I confused right. zip bombs oh, that's a good point. with concatenation. Mm. Me too. <clears throat> right. So that's what I was thinking we were going to be yeah. talking yeah. about here too. So, okay. So, so you the concatenate. The header of the one and the, and the end of the other act as the header in the end, even though there's another header and an end in the middle. Oh, interesting. Okay. So, so you could, uh, you know, essentially when you're, when you're unpacking whatever that, that compressed file is, you could essentially get an extra file that you, you weren't aware of or didn't see. Is that, is that the issue? I, uh, I guess I don't, I, yeah. It, well, well, the, the, the anti-virus, anti-malware, anti-whatever the hell it is these days won't I got see you. the malware in the middle there. That's because okay, it's confused it. by the dip by all the headers and footers. It's like, it's okay. I see the header of a zip file. I'm fine. The footer of a zip file. Oh, wait, there's a whole nother zip file behind it, but I don't even see the damn thing. Got it. Yeah. So there's been some really neat. So with zip bombs, we've seen some really neat mm. stuff over, over the years, right? That, mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, there were one of the ones that, that Trent found actually. So Servo found was, uh, that web delivered mal malware, uh, would, would be, would include a zip bomb right so for those that aren't aware you you create a like a, a terabyte file of all zeros and when you compress it it, it compresses down to uh, you know essentially a byte right oh right or that's a, a, zip a little bomb. bit uh, different right, than a little a bit more than a, a zip so now we're on yeah, right. three different attacks that i i confuse them all in my brain yep. <laughs> right and so like what what would happen is when those would be downloaded and then um exploded in our you know in our in our malware analysis system you know, they don't have a ter terabyte of, of files. And so the, the system would just move on and say, well, I can't check that one because of size limits moving on. Right. So, but this one's very different, right? That's, that's interesting. Yeah, so no, your open, bypass. Now put a zip bomb in one of these concatenated ones. Right. You could hide the presence <laughs> yeah. of a zip bomb. Now we're on to something. Yeah. yeah. Wait, so you put a I've, zip bomb inside of a concatenated zip file. I think that's how we make a time machine or something, I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So 7-zip, so we, the yeah. example... Put a fork bomb in there. The example is yeah. they created two two text files with different contents. 
Yep. They used uh, 7-Zip to zip both of them. Separately. Uh, separately. Yep. So, so first uh, file went in the first zip. Second file went in the second zip file. Then they concatenated the files together using the cat command. Yep. And cat, cat one, cat two into cat into combined. Redirected that into combine.zip. Yep. So when 7-Zip on Windows opens the combine.zip, it opens the first zip file yeah for the, fir, the first directory what, what do they call it um because it stops the, at the footer the, it stops at the right. end central of the first directory zip file it, it takes right. the oh, first that's... central directory of the zip file <clears throat> that's fucking beautiful i gotta Headers give you credit that's... are just bytes right we call it magic bytes that's how the file magic, command on, magic on linux yeah yeah, yeah. Numbers, it's, it's a specific bytes. sequence right. that indicates the beginning and end of a zip file right and that's brilliant that they notice that unintended functionality. Yeah, because WinRAR does the opposite. It opens the second zip file. Yep. Really? Oh, it, it opens neat. the second. What? What? What is that? Uh, the, it opens the second central directory. Mm. Oh, that's cool. Yep. Windows Explorer so, just says, "I give up." And then, <laughs> no. uh, Tarball, anyone? Tarball? What does What does Mac do? I'm curious. Does it? It's a good question. They didn't say. You could very easily replicate this experiment. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to now. Now I have to try this. Kids, this is cool. you can try this at home. Yeah, but you'll yes. screw up your parents' computer. Be careful. <laughs> so it's various zip headers, including those commonly used by popular cybersecurity. So many security vendors rely on popular zip handlers, like 7-Zip or OS native tools, to parse zip files for further analysis. Oh, interesting. So they don't include their own. They're using someone else's. Again, somewhere yeah. in the archives, we talked at length about the... Decom compression and decompression. And, uh, but really, doesn't uh, anybody tarball anymore? Anyone? I mean, I do because I use Linux. Okay. But if you're using Windows, you're not necessarily tarballing. Uh, I don't know if the tar it command is even available on Windows. I thought it used to be for a little while, but mm. I, I mean, know. but it might have been because there was gzip for a while before, which. Which was an alternative to WinZip, or just Zip back in the old days. But Zip, GZip, and WinZip, from my research, at various points in time, mm -hmm. use different compression yeah. algorithms in the back right. end. Yes, so they are. Like Which is why essentially different. This might make a difference. Correct. I didn't think we were going to spend that much time on there, but I'm glad we did. Just talking about that's pretty cool. Compression dude. as it relates to security is apparently really interesting to us. Hopefully, you, those of you listening at home as well. So I think it's on, interesting guys. that like compressing files is kind of like a fad, right? Like they they each get their time in the sun, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so like RAR had its time and uh, Zip, and now I kind of feel like Seven Zip is the is the new, you know, shiny like, hotness. Yeah. yeah. Shiny hotness. As shiny and hot compression. as compression can be. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> I just really quick, I was hoping for a better article in number 17 uh, in my stories. The uh, mm -hmm. Flipper Zero explained how it learns and controls infrared signals is a great. If you've never done anything with infrared um, and just haven't looked into it at all, it's a great primer. Right about like the very high level basic, and it's got a pretty cool introductory um, little diagram there that I liked about the uh, wavelengths that so you got radio waves, microwaves, infrared, and then visible light, right? Ultraviolet, X rays, and gamma rays to kind of put it in <clears throat> in a spectrum that you could uh, understand, um, and then it just t really talks about the high level. What I really want to dig into more so dabbled a little bit with the infrared stuff mostly just using other people's code and putting it on hardware that does infrared tomfoolery essentially uh many of us fondly remember or maybe still use the tvb gone in fact if you look at a lot of infrared implementations on esp32 based platforms a lot of them still borrow from the original TVB gone code, whether yep. that's the actual code itself or whether that's the TV um, on off codes that are in that original. <clears throat> Who was that that did that? What was his name? TVB gone. Uh, TV gone. Man, it's right Mitch, there. Mitch, Mitch, Mitch Altman. Yeah. Mitch Altman. Mitch Altman. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so thanks to Mitch for 
open source <clears throat> open sourcing that some time ago and it's mm. still yeah a, what a, a weird a, hippie like what a weird hippie and he was so far ahead of right? the game man loved it you're like yeah man he was like he remember all that stuff that he would release like the things the glasses that glasses. you put on your eyes that yeah. like made you feel like you're on acid or something and yes yes the, be, the that beer the goggles show. the beer goggles yeah yeah, yeah it was wild <laughs> um so I, I just I really want to dig into I need to do some more reading. It's on my list. Um, I want to see how the data is represented on the various hardware platforms, right? Mm -hmm. Different IR transceivers operate differently, attached to some kind of other platform, perhaps differently, have to have different code that's running on them. I want to learn how to write that code. But also, there's different formats for infrared codes. Right, right? Like fi flipper, fi file formats. Uh, file yeah. formats for like the how you describe the the ones and zeros the ones and zeros yeah, to ones transmit and yeah. like for example <clears throat> if i wanted to power off the tv <clears throat> i typically put in some kind of file uh or inside of my code describe yep. the bits right yep <clears throat> and then code would interpret that and then transmit that over the infrared yep. transmitter uh and there's multiple different ways to do it like the flipper has a huge database but there's other open source databases of uh, infrared codes. They're in like slightly different file formats, different mm -hmm. descriptor formats. So. I, I bet you could get AI to uh, write a converter for you. I think someone already did write a converter, actually. Nice. Because um, in some of the implementations I've seen on some of the ESP32 devices, have said that. I think they were like, hmm. I, I either wrote. They're like, I, I wrote this, this or I, I used. It. Yeah, I used this to convert it to. Yeah. Yep. All fun stuff. Nice. Hey, just to step oh. back to our last story real quick. Uh, I tested on the Mac um, in similar format to the, what they did. I created a 1.txt, a 2.txt. Mm -hmm. I zipped them into 1.zip, 2.zip, concatenated them together, and then used the Mac archive utility to extract the concatenated, yeah. and I got 1.txt. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. And that's yeah. it. So I really, really form. want to talk about your story number 12, man. Me? My yeah. story number 12? Skeletons, Skeletons in, in the, the closet. closet. Yeah, I've got that one up and ready to roll. I am this like one. so, so, I, I talked about that today. I think I talked about that twice today, actually. Then not that specific story, but the idea of legacy hardware, legacy software, end of life stuff. Like, do you just expect people throw it out and have the budget to get new stuff the minute at end of life's? Right. Let, let me ask you a question. How many of you have had like monstrous, monstrous Cisco cabinets back in the day mm -hmm. or Juniper or, or, or whatever, you know, a, a checkpoint F5, something. Nortel like, networks. Oh, we're, we're, what's extreme that? Extreme, extreme networks were the prettiest. <laughs> the purple, the purple <laughs> ones were pretty, weren't they? Yeah. Are they still around? Yeah. I didn't even know that dude. Seriously, not even a joke, but like you're talking about things that are tens of, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yep. And oh, by the way, we're end of lifeing that in three months. What? What? Well, usually you get a little bit more notice than that, but still, mm. even if you get three years, we're end of lifeing that in three years. Like Cisco is good for publishing, you know, far dates out for stuff like that, two, three years out. Well, unless it's but a even, small business line. But even still, oh, but you know, they just I mean, if, it. back to Josh's <laughs> example, if we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, still, you may not be able to get budget in two years to replace. <laughs> Half a million dollars worth of gear. And this, by the way, this never it. comes up in PCI. So I'm just going to let you guys yeah. chat. Right? <laughs> Lying. <laughs> Hold on, but let's, let's table. Let's table the Cisco F5, Avanti, Fortinet, all all those. Uh, this is actually a an Avanti product that is referenced in this article from Praetorian Skeletons in the Closet. But it's actually their Avanti endpoint manager that was running on a lockdown Windows 10 PC. So. It's oh, already it's a Windows endpoint 10. Manager. Endpoint endpoint manager lets you manage your endpoints. It lets you query the software. From my understanding, it lets you install software. I think it might even have like a remote access component. Like when we say endpoint manager, we really mean to like manage your endpoint. And every time I read the description for Avanti endpoint manager, usually in conjunction with some vulnerabilities they have disclosed in this software mm -hmm. and other <laughs> Avanti software. Now look, we all live in glass houses. Yep. There'll be a lot of shattered glass if we started throwing rocks, so myself included. I'm not knocking them, but my thought goes to, well, what if an attacker would exploit <clears throat> Avanti Endpoint Manager? That could be bad. No, they didn't do could this on control. the server side. They did this on the client side. 
So here's a case that we warn people about. You've got All a locked down computer. You're putting software on it to manage it, to make it more secure, more reliable. But that software is what Praetorian used to gain access to uh, this particular PC. And then with great detail, all the technical details uh, are there, which so I, I, I can't I, pretend to, to regurgitate on the show. So I, like, I, I think that the, the big issue here, especially if we take a look at the example that you guys gave earlier with, where we're talking about $100,000 equipment or, or even software or whatever, you know, a lot of times um, if, if you're in an enterprise situation, um, you, you're going to need those, those CVEs. You're going to need those vulnerabilities to justify the replacement of these devices, right? Like mm. um, just to say right. that, that this hardware is end of life, you know, the, the question then becomes, well, is it still working, right? Like how many, how many more years can we squeeze out of this, right? Can like, I get my cat pictures across it still? That, that, that's exactly <laughs> right, right? And until you can actually show a real business justification for replacing it, right? Like th there's no reason to replace it, right? If it still works, then great. Like, um, uh, so, but well, enter PCI. Well, okay. PCI right. So not, been, not every, PCI not every has been forcing... PCI has been forcing refreshes of end of life systems for, dare I say, twenty years. For but sure. without I mean, the vulnerability requirement, Jeff, I think is your point, right? Yeah, I mean, there, regardless of vulnerability, and and you know, I wanted to pick up on let's finish Bill's train of thought, but I wanted to pick up on the rhetorical questions that you asked in, in the comments of your article, yeah. and then comment well, on. on the article. We have, but we let's finish told Bill's our... thought. But we haven't told no, the audience what the deal is with this, but go ahead, finish, Bill. And then I just, I want to go back to the article so our audience knows. Well, why don't you go and then Jeff and I will talk. Yeah. So, <laughs> so oh, what I happened here? shit to put in there too. Praetorian <laughs> <clears throat> finds vulnerabilities in Avanti Endpoint Manager software running on the Windows 10 target that they were contracted uh, to pen test. They uh, contact Avanti and they're like, hey, we found, I think a couple of vulnerabilities, at least one, right? And <clears throat> at least one or like, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Correct. And Avanti says, well, that's great, but this software is end of life and this software will not get patches. Therefore, we will not release a CVE mm -hmm. for this. What? Which is okay. Now, so you know, let's be clear. Jeff. They're saying there is a vulnerability. Correct. We agree that there's a vulnerability, but because it's end of life, we're not even going to apply for or right. issue because they're an issuer, I think. We're not is, even going to issue. This is not which... the software you need to be concerned with. <laughs> right. So there is no vulnerability here. This software doesn't exist because it's end of life. It doesn't exist. There are no more vulnerabilities in it because it doesn't it's not exist. Just, look, I'm not going to pick on Avanti. More vendors than just oh, Avanti do this, right? Sure. So this, this, is, this is just, just one example. The, yeah, but what vendors are, are saying is that software that end of life, once I end of life, it, it doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> and I absolve yeah. myself of all responsibility See, for this, here's for the this problem. software. Here's the problem. I would understand if they said it's end of life. We're not going to issue a patch because in, if you want to pay for it, we'll issue a patch. If you don't right, want to pay for, sure. for it, it's end of life. We're done. But they should still issue a CVE mm -hmm. because at least it will be helpful for people to use that CVE to do what, uh, Bill, I think you're the one that said it. If, if I have a CVE that's a 9, 10, blah, 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 whatever, at least I can go to the boss and go, I need but, that. But. Yes, PCI? Well, I'm just, and I'm, I'm putting on used to work for Tenable hat. How are they going to know that that CVE is out there? Because Tenable, for example, if it hit an, a system that was end of life, it would just flag it as end of life and move on. It wouldn't, and of course, I'm, I haven't been there in several years. I'm kind of impressed that this pen test, what, this Avanti thing found these vulnerabilities. But then I'm thinking the typical scan that people are yeah. running and relying on to go through their, you know, their monthly patch management cycle isn't finding it. Why? Because there's no CVE. Why is there no CVE? Because nobody wants to deal with the patching. It, it's kind of like this. No, there is. Logic you know loop. why there's no CVE? You know why there's no CVE? Because I just looked it up and this was my suspicion. Avanti mm -hmm. is the CNA for its software products. So right. a CNA is the hmm. CVE numbering authority, which means uh, it's a certified Mitre, administrator. Miter has had the ceremony <laughs> with the sword, and everyone mm -hmm. gets dressed up and has gone mm -hmm. Avanti. I now uh, dub w. you the sole issuer 
and uh, uh, <clears throat> decision maker for all CVEs issued for the software that you own, which is bullshit. Seems so, like a conflict of interest to me. I yeah, agree. Thank you. Bullshit. Thank you. Y'all so it's, going, it's, it's uh, say, Moses' are... staff that turns into a snake mid swing or something. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And, and Jeff, this is, it doesn't seem like it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because if they weren't a CNA, I could go directly to MITRE and I could get a CVE issued. Now, you know, but I, even, I'm really curious. But even if they did issue a CVE, what scan engine would flag it? Because it sounded like this was a you know this was a targeted pen test, and so they were digging deep. And if the and or how many people are using this Avanti tool for their vulnerability scanning to meet their vulnerability scanning requirements? I'm not sure I, that it has a vulnerability it scanner in it, but uh, and and even still, also the good ones will call it. A, I think Nessus did it for older operating systems. Is definitely a case mm -hmm. I recall. I don't know how pervasive end of life software was. So if the software is end of life, it just said it's end of life, you need to get rid of it, and didn't even if there mm -hmm. were. CVEs aside, and and to it me, just said this software. I thought it was just operating systems. And, and well, to me, that's operating a, systems it would stop and pass over. I don't. But then, what about any software running on that operating system? Yeah. I don't and, think. And, I don't think Nessus looked at it. And, and that said, like that's it. To me, that seems like a huge failure in those automated scanning tools. End of mm. life, like yeah, I may have an organization where I have stuff that has been end of life, and I have no choice but to use this. Right. Yep. And if there is a new CVE for this, I want to know about the CVE so that I can potentially enhance any compensating controls that I have around this device because I need Absolutely. to use this in my environment. CISA added a CVE from 2014 for Cisco ASA firewalls. It's a cross-site scripting uh, hmm. in the management interface because, because they observed it being exploded in the wild. So it's a 10-year-old CVE. I didn't look it up, but highly likely that that version of ASA that has that vulnerability is probably end of life, end of life by Cisco. Yep. Uh, and all, ASA, I all ASAs are gone. If you, it does, I think you're absolutely correct, but, Josh, now that, now that you say that. But is Cisco a CNA for their products? It doesn't matter. In this case, it doesn't matter because CV had already been issued. They probably are today. Wait, wait. The, wait, the, the CVE, CVE is from 2014. It was issued in 2014. Oh. Vulnerability was discovered in 2014. A CVE was issued. Um, what is that? In uh, 2014? What is that uh, company? Trustwave? Okay. Trustwave <laughs> had a blog post about it. <laughs> okay. Um, and said, oh, like, this is an issue. And like, we think we, this is the exploit for it and published about it. Got it. So this is but a 2014. It, not, a, not, a, not something that was discovered in 2014 is <clears throat> being exploited in 2024. And now they issued a CVE for in 2024. Someone affiliated with the, uh, with <clears throat> C or CISA, like in CISA's network of folks that report to them mm -hmm. observable <laughs> vulnerabilities being exploited in the wild said, hey, we noticed a threat actor exploiting the Cisco ASA device. It had a vulnerability from 2014. I hope it, what CISA does is validate it and just, sure. you know, all that stuff. They go, oh, well, they they used that an exploit for a CV from 2014. That goes on the known exploited vulnerabilities list. Even oh, into the Kev. Yeah, into totally. Kev. Totally. Right. That's what I was saying. It's in the Kev. Okay. See, I thought you were going with that. It was a vulnerability discovered in 2014 reported. They didn't issue a CVE no, then no, no. because Cisco... Uh, was that and then now 2024 they see it exploited in the wild so they issue a cve but they backdated it because it was discovered in 2014 right that's where i thought you were going with this because i'm i was going to call so, BS but this has too. other implications because to get on the kev it has to have a cve and so no, no and the life software it has not to have a cv and a, and a patch doesn't it? in a patch correct yes yeah well i hope whoever at avanti chose not to give it a cve goes to jail well, damn. <laughs> yeah. All right, Mr. Wow. Vigilante of the Internet. Uh, there you go. Yeah. But I think Bill's on to something. In right. that you hear that, Avanti? There's no, You're going to jail. <laughs> there's no accountability. That's nope. ridiculous. Okay, right? so what there's would no be, let me ask you Software question. companies have no accountability in this case. Ba back, what back would the Jeff's appropriate this... accountability be? Yeah. Well, back to Jeff's, the seal is like a... Uh, uh, oh, God. Conflict of interest. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> this feels like a conflict of interest. No, it's not. Feels like it is a conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. Okay, so should a should a company be forced to issue a CVE for software that it built thirty years ago? Yes. And there are companies that built software thirty years ago still around. Yes. We're not, okay. But wait, see, but we're not even asking for a patch. 
Nope. Right. We're just asking for a CVE exact... to be issued. <laughs> We're not that asking for anything. Do you require that you oh. take their word for it, or do you have to test it? Because mm. if I have to spend money, I'm, I'm going to play devil's advocate for a minute. If I'm a company that wrote software 30 years ago, and I have to test that, that and somebody goes, hey, I was playing with this because my name is, you know, H.D. Moore or whatever, okay? And, uh, or Paul Asadorian, that jackass. And <laughs> I found a vuln, I found a bug, I found an issue. I want you yeah. to issue a CVE. If you're a CNA, that is 100% your responsibility to, mm -hmm. in Do you fact, have to test that it is to make sure why, it's real? That is why people become CNAs, so that they can validate the reports that are Stop. coming in. Validate. You've just made me spend money on Correct. something I don't I don't spend money on anymore. And hell, if it was 30 years ago, the developers probably I don't even have anybody that can touch that software anymore. That can even but run it. To to it clarify like like those that want a CVE issued, is it and I'm just making sure I'm understanding the, the logic. Is it simply so you know that you have you're running something that has a problem? Because you're saying you don't have to have a patch necessarily, you just want the CVE. Is that simply so you have the awareness? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, for me, yeah. I, I want to know that hold there on. are more vulnerabilities well, hold on. found. Well, hold on. So uh, Josh, can... to your point, yeah. in the Praetorian article, they say, after we reported this issue to Avanti, they confirmed they were unaware and right. that the proof of concept was valid. So they validated it. Oh, so they did validate it. They, they spent time it. to validate it. Correct. Hmm. Then they just decided not to issue a CVE. Like, you know, the oh, thing. Then the we didn't know bags. about this. We validated it. Like, the final step is to just... Like fill out some paperwork, right? And file they're, a CV. they're total fucking douchebags. And but those, I, if those, that, please feel free to come yell at me. Those that live by the CVE that they're discovering Die by the CVE because of their scan reports. Uh, pretty sure most of them are you know going down to the bottom to see what the mitigation is. And I'm just wondering if part of the motivation is that if they're you know for whatever reason. They don't want to issue a patch. They don't want to do the research. They're not f even sure how they'd get the patch out there. Is that their rationale for not doing the CVE? Because no, they don't have by, a, because they product. can't put a fix in it. But the uh, D Link has they do that all the time for D Link. Mm -hmm. And D Link's just like, oh, end of life, not issuing patches. You should buy a new device. I mean, that's great. But Nick, Nick, right. is a very responsible but still, company in vulnerabilities, they, and they say the same but, thing. But they still issue CVEs. And but they issue CVEs. Or, or have CVE well, issue, CVEs issued on their I, behalf. When we get into IoT devices, I don't know who's a CNA and who isn't. But yeah. but, uh, our, but my argue, guess is D Link is not a CNA because CVEs get issued like willy nilly for that. But level. but but arguably. There are still CVEs issued for end of life mm, devices correct. for D Link stuff and other man manufacturers. Mm. I, it, it really, we're all not yeah. happy with this situation. No, so just let the record state. I think Jeff. We're all not thrilled. One. We're all not thrilled about. I, this. I, I think Jeff is the only one who's like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> well, well, because I mean, in PCI it, world, you can't have end of life software. Is that correct, Jeff? Software or hardware. Is there you go. Very difficult to have. How far? How far past end of life? Like, if, if something says end of life January twenty twenty four, December thirty first, twenty twenty four. How long you got, Josh? Yeah, because because there's end of life, and then there's end of support, and yeah, then yeah, there's yeah. extended contracts. Okay, and so that's what I'm asking. Microsoft I'm asking is this. Microsoft has been collecting millions over the years for extended support contracts right. for retail XP. merchants that. Well, XP, years ago, XP. well, it predates XP, but a lot of cash registers, point of sale systems back in the day were running on XP or prior. And then they all got upgraded to Windows, whatever, 2003. And then they got end of life uh, and so on and so forth. I mean, I had a client, it's been a few years, but they were paying the first year for the extended uh, support. And this wasn't even a guarantee of anything. It was like, we'll give you an 800 number if you have a problem, call it. It was very limited extended support. $500,000 for the first year, and it doubled the second year, and it doubled the third year. So 500, 1 million, 2 million, just for the privilege of calling up uh, an 800 number if you discover a problem. It goes to the and Microsoft retirement home. There you go. <laughs> I'm sorry. But the and the nuance though, which is why I keep going back to the patch. The requirement in question for PCI is make sure you issue uh, or, or you install patches for critical security problems thirty days after release of the patch. 
And the argument has always been, if somebody's, something's not getting supported, there's no patches being issued. So from a PCI perspective, it's kind of uh, neither here nor there whether there's a CVE issues. It's whether there's a fix for the problem or not, mm. if well, you're, I'm, in fact, discovering the problem in the first place. Yeah. I mean, arguably, the fix for that would be to... You know, update. retire, up, up, <laughs> yeah. buy, buy new stuff. So then you have yeah. 30 days to buy. And, and Jeff, thinking about some of the, you know, getting around the rules, like if you have Windows XP and there are no critical vulnerabilities found in Windows XP for two years, you arguably have a two year window until one is issued and then you have 30 days to, fu- to upgrade. Yeah, so I if you have 10,000 Windows argue. XP machines running a point of sale system, then you have 30 days to upgrade all 30,000. <laughs> yeah, I mean, now you have other problems. <laughs> <laughs> your problems have problems at that yeah. point. Yeah, you put a problem inside your problem. Right. And, and then you only extract but you can you cat- but the last... two of your problems into another problem. Yes. But the <laughs> last sentence in this something. article, if you get all the way to the bottom, the conclusion, they hard. say, beware of the skeletons in your legacy systems patch regularly and test often but we just got done tar- talking about how well it doesn't matter if there's a patch or not maybe there isn't yeah. a patch. it doesn't matter if you test or pat- i mean testing would say yeah it, well it'd be hard it's harder to test because there's no cve issue right uh, well that's my point if it's if there's no cve it's not going to show up in the scan engine well, likely not going to be found not going to be an necessarily issue. not not how i've been guiding our product um because I don't, I don't care if there's Do a tell. CVE or not. I don't care if there's a CVE or not. So we implement detections for vulnerabilities, misconfigurations, threats, uh, and firmware integrity. Wait, in wait, the, wait, wait, wait. I'm going to. But you're not a company CVE. that's you're not a company that's scanning a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand endpoints. Well, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. I mean, here's here's my point, <laughs> Paul. How would you know about this one if 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 you didn't read this article and and, and there wasn't a CVE? How well, could you test for something com- that doesn't that's exist? That's why companies need to do threat and vulnerability research to go, we can't just rely on <clears throat> these neat little package lists of vulnerabilities. You're not going to make everybody take the red pill, Paul, no matter how hard you try. That was no, he goes for the blue attack. pill. That was, those were hypervisor <laughs> attacks. But uh, no, well, it was I'm a matrix reference. Little blue pill, <laughs> Paul. But even, but even when I looked at all of the detections across the vulnerability scanners, that was 10 years ago now. Mm-hmm. There existed checks that there did not correspond back to a CVE in all products, mm-hmm. in all products. So they do, they do test for conditions that aren't defined by a CVE. And that's harder sure. to measure because there's no tracking <laughs> for it. There's no neat number to track it by. But then how do we track zero-day vulnerabilities? Now, one can go back to the Avanti Endpoint Manager in Praetorium. Is that a zero-day exploit? Yep. Yep. I would like to go back to Praetorian and see if they could get this access to this test Mm -hmm. device or just ask them, did you try running, you know, Nessus or Qualys or whatever your Mm -hmm. scanner du jour is? And did it come anywhere close to finding what you guys found doing your Mm -hmm. targeted testing? Because the article starts with this was a targeted analysis, targeted test. I don't think it's a zero day if the vendor knows about it. I think it's a half day or a one day. I think it's a one day is the, how it's defined, mm. right? But people will call it a zero day because it looks it looks nicer when yeah. you publish your article for XYZ journalist, you know, media outlet. This was an was evaluation of the security posture of a public facing kiosk system. Mm. So they didn't call it a pen test. They didn't call it a security test. Well, it, right. This was an evaluation of the security posture, hmm. which I kind of like that they came up with yeah. a new way of describing it. No, yeah, Petroleum has done good work and still does good work to this day. But I thought it was going someplace else because the kiosks mm. that I've seen have been payment devices, you know, checkout, self, self-checkout self devices, terminals and things like that. Yeah. Um, and usually in the they lower... they didn't go in, there. They didn't seem to go that direction. <clears throat> usually I've, I see images that in the lower right-hand corner, there's a, a Windows activation notification like overlaid on the menu. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Oops. Uh, All right. Anyway, uh, there's been <coughs> a surge in exploits of zero day vulnerabilities. Speaking of zero days, warns the five eyes. <coughs> this is a significant departure from 2022 and 2021. 
uh, where agencies warned of, of this activity. Um, <clears throat> they co-authored this new advisory and they list the top 15 most routinely exploited vulnerabilities in 2023. Um, tops on that list, Citrix net scalers being the most widely used. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, they warned that uh, China Nexus Group, amazing group, Velvet Ant. Got to go read about Velvet Ant to get some insights into how China Nexus is operating. Uh, there was flaws associated with them as well as Cisco routers, Fortinet VPN equipment. I did some quick back of the napkin math with an LLM to analyze the vulnerabilities that were published in this report. I think what Larry and I concluded before the show was roughly 50% of them were uh, give on, it, give or take. Give or take a margin of error. <laughs> were on network appliances, network devices. Fortinet, Cisco, uh, F. Five might have been in F five, I believe, was in that list. Zoho routers, which is in most of those, were zero day uh, exploits, which was increased from twenty twenty two. Hmm. Why? That's a great question, Josh. Why? <coughs> I mean, like, what the hell is going on? Is there any correlation? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I should, we button. should probably turn on the news and see if there's any like <laughs> major conflicts or <clears throat> well, I mean, is political that, is that unrest or yeah. potential. Most of, I was thinking the best way to articulate this. Most of the activity and exploitation that we see targeted against network appliances, devices, and IoT routers has been traced back to Chinese threat actors. Volt Typhoon, Velvet Ant, Pacific Rim, mm. uh, Salt oh. Typhoon. I, and I, and w would you consider potentially Russian threat actors in that as well, too? I mean, I would, but most of the things that I'm covering when I talk about those campaigns, all, all every Chinese single one of them goes. Like, it, it's, it seems like the Russian threat Russians actors have kind of, it too, but kind of dropped off from the spotlight a little bit. Maybe. Uh, either, well, they got conscripted they're not getting, and sent uh, to the front line. But getting to Josh's busy. question, that's, that's why, exactly right. Why Josh are they, exactly why right. are they zero day exploits? And because the threat actors right now are the only one or the majority of the folks who are looking at vulnerabilities on these platforms of all the platforms that are listed in this report and all the other typhoon reports and all that stuff not one of them is someone correct me if i'm wrong but in my research not one of them has a bug bounty a public bug bounty program or even a private bug Ooh. bounty program where people are looking at these vulnerabilities which Ooh. leaves them to internally discover and disclose vulnerabilities which most of the time if you read these reports every week like i do they are not doing either there's yeah. no acknowledgement in there or the acknowledgement is well yeah crap china found this <laughs> zero day exploit we noticed it observed it in the wild it was being exploited mm. therefore we trace it back to a vulnerability and we had to go fix the vulnerability and since this is like the uh target platform du jour of Chinese threat actors, uh, they're, it's all zero days. And that's why it skewed the data to go, oh my God, yep. it, was, oh my God it was all zero days. And there you have it. So, so let's be clear. Of the major country threat actors out there, that being North Korea, Russia, China, a little bit of Iran. America. Um, China is absolutely state controlled. They're going after nation state targets. They're not like randomly going after money or whatever else. Right. They're submitting to the bug bounty programs. I, I'm mistaken. Sophos did have a, does have a bug bounty program. Um, they weren't mentioned in this report, but uh, they do have a bug bounty program. And I think I mis misspoke. Uh, I've been reading the copious amounts of data from Pacific Rim. Chinese threat actors actually reported to Sophos through their bug bounty program. Right. Why? It, well, right. That's my question. Well, Why? Because they got paid. Yeah. Maybe and maybe my 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 guess my guess they've got so many zero days for these platforms. They're like, yeah, you know what? We should like cash some of those in. It's like spare change you got later on the draw. Like, ah, I got so much spare change. I might as well just go cash some of it in. Right? Well, it's, so it's, it's, so it's beer so, money or sake yeah. money or whatever they what's, drink. What's, right. what's those? What's those machines at the grocery store where you drop the change in? Yeah, um, Coinstar. Yeah, Coinstar. Coinstar. Thank you. Yeah. So, so Paul, well, you said Chinese threat actors. 
yeah. like you said, Chinese threat actors are submitting bug bounties. What, like, how do you differentiate that between just a, a researcher in China? I mean, like, and, and where, did you say that correctly? Like, when you say Chinese threat actors are submitting Ooh. bug bounties, it, yeah. maybe it's just I, there research. may be some bias there, Bill, Bill because there's the re- no difference. Yeah, then that's kind of where I'm going. <laughs> exactly know. what that's, Josh said. Well, I, I, I don't I, know if I believe that. I know, I know, and that's that's very prejudiced of me to assume that, but. Uh, what leads me to believe that evidence behind my thinking is that there is a law in China that if you discover a vulnerability, you have to report it to the state first. Yeah. Before yeah. you can report it externally. And, and Bill, yep. to, to, to and, and one clarify. second in between the two is still reporting it first. Yeah. And to clarify, Bill, there are independent researchers in China. Okay. Security sure. researchers. I agreed. However, at their core, if they don't put their government first, they go their to government them. will put them under a stone somewhere. Yeah. Right. So there is no difference in effect. Okay. So, I mean, let's be clear. Just curious. Uh, And we're very serious today. We're we're all kind of of serious. Anywhere you want. I just, I want to go back to this. Lighten the mood, Bill. (laughs) Hold on. And the police come and pick you up. I got something more. Uh, so Ali Whitehouse, the uh, NCSC's chief technology officer, is quoted as saying in this article uh, on the zero day upticks uh, in, in the article the Five Eyes posted, he says, to reduce the risk of compromise, it's vital that all organizations stay on the front foot by applying patches promptly and insisting upon by secure by design products in the technology marketplace. Hmm. Should we also be rebooting our devices too? <laughs> So, but hold on. I just want to pick that apart for a moment. <laughs> Why? They said that there's an uptick in zero day exploits, which means the vendor is not aware there's a vulnerability. Therefore, they have not issued a patch. So it's pretty hard to apply patches promptly. Let's not apply and logic stay, to this, Paul. Oh, come and on. Stay, and stay on the front foot to patch things that the, even the vendor doesn't know about. Right. And then they go. The, the I, get secure, where, I get where he's going. But with they this, push but. the secure, <laughs> secure by design thing. If vendors in this space actually implemented secure by design, we wouldn't be having this conversation in the first place. Yeah. What we have is chest beating by failure all to of communicate. The, yeah, chest beating by all of these vendors. They go, oh yeah, we'll sign the secure by default, secure by design pledge. Woohoo, look at me. And then tomorrow, China goes, Oh, hey, look, another zero day. Like, look at that. Like, maybe I'll exploit that to improve my botnet. Accomplish my goals and then cash it in yep. for a bug bounty. And like now, they're literally like nee, 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 right in our face. Uh, well, right in our faces. In 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 defense of the you know signing that secure by design uh, <laughs> pledge stuff, uh, you sign the pledge, and like it's you not... signed a pledge in high school that you wouldn't do alcohol and drugs. It's right? Like and, really? But, but, did you really? But did still, you really? but still, <laughs> you sign that pledge, <laughs> and. It's not something that you shift to overnight. And signing that no, pledge says sign that the you... pledge like the next night. <laughs> 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 and that's exactly what they're doing. No, no, they're not. <laughs> Paul, I work for a company that has signed the Secure by Design pledge. Oh, I'm sorry. It is not something no, that no, you can sorry. shift to. No, it's, imme- yeah, it's, it's, it is, facetiously, I'm sorry. It is not something that you can switch over to immediately. It, it is a gradual approach. Your developers may, and I'm not saying ours in particular, your developers <coughs> may need more training. You may need to change some process. And some of these processes, you cannot sign the pledge and go, okay, we're done. It's going to take some time to implement. And th- that said, you are going to have potentially years worth of mistakes before you sign this pledge that you need to address as part of your secure by design pledge. <clears throat> so my call is because, and I like where they were going on the security conversations podcast with this. And I want to give uh, Ryan and Vaughn and Constine credit for this because they were spot on and they were like, look in the Pacific rim attacks. So was deployed uh, kernel level malware to gain telemetry, which is cool. Why don't we as customers that own these devices from all of these vendors making mm-hmm. networks and appliances, why, why don't we have the same level of visibility and telemetry? I don't want the, wait, wait, I don't want the vendor to do it. Wait, I, don't, I, don't, I bought the device mine now. Dude, I called that I out. I want to do it. I called that out on, on the show. On, no. uh, on the show. I'll give like, you credit. As well. what, like, if they, the more I if, think about that, the more sense it makes if to we, me. If they have the telemetry and there's telemetry available on the system, why don't we have access to it? And why right. why is right. it not that easy for us to now, enable Now, double-edged that? sword is kernel-level rootkits could fall into the wrong hands. Mm-hmm. 
But mm-hmm. that's true of any, no. you know, any technology. Yeah. And, and I argue with just any telemetry. It doesn't have mm-hmm. to be telemetry from a kernel of a rootkit. Right, like right, that, right, right. that device is sending shit to syslog. And maybe we don't even have access to the stuff uh, on, on syslog. It should from send the right it. shit to syslog, though. Like, I want the, the the point being is that I can get shit from syslog, right? <laughs> and I may not be able to. And no, I mean, not a lot of people are great at doing that, <laughs> analyzing the logs and looking for things. Okay. But that's fine. That's on you now, right? right? The responsibility right, exactly. is on you. Exactly. If it, the command history of every command that's ever been uh, run on the device is somewhere in a log, and you just haven't found it, that's on you. Yeah. And but if it's some the output of every command run on the system is in a log somewhere, and that log and you has can't no figure cap- it out. You should call Bill. No, Bill can help you. With no that. capability of getting access to that log either through some interface or, and not have to go and do unsupported command line hackery to get access to that. It should be supported from the manufacturer. Yeah, I agree. And they shouldn't I, charge charge extra for it. Nope. I think Paul, you're missing the silver lining of this article. By the way, no. Oh, what is that? Um, somewhere towards the end, like the fourth to last paragraph, it says the advisory notes that for the first time since the U S cybersecurity and infrastructure security agency, that's CISA CISA, and partners began sharing this annual list. The majority of the vulnerabilities contained on it were initially exploited as zero days. That tells me that in years past, the exploitation was stuff that was out there that was being exploited because right. people weren't patching their shit. So it sounds to me like the bad guys are having to work a little bit harder and come up is with that, the, what that smell zero from days. Chef? Is that is that optimism from the curmudgeon? <laughs> wow. No, nah, I wouldn't wow. go that far. I'm, I'm a, just saying you're missing the silver linings. Right, it was just hints. It was hint, it was hints of <laughs> optimism. Uh, see, see, and I thought it was toast. I thought it, I thought it was burning, yeah, burning hair or burning yeah. toast or something bad, but whew. You know, Jeff, Jeff who can we call for you? Or... Apparently, you're having a stroke. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should go check my blood pressure. I'll be back. I'll wait no, not, for the no, break. No, not that kind of stroke. <coughs> right. Oh, let him finish. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm going to let you finish. But <laughs> Where do we want to go next? Oh. Where can we go next? Boy. Hell. We're going to oh, hell. Re- we, uh, we've got 15 minutes before our yeah. next thing. Um, 15 minutes, Larry. Um, do, 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 Captures yeah. number 10. Skynet? Skynet? Skynet's good. Both. Oh, this, this, Skynet. Bill? No. No. Next. Oh, <laughs> shit. Jeff's number one, Jeff's number one article. No, we oh, could number do that one, one article. <sighs> Trust wave and cyber reason merge. Next, next. next. <laughs> 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 uh, oh. You saw my done. Comment. Done. <laughs> oh, oh uh, uh, Jeff's number five, which is also Paul's. Where's the Move It breach? The Amazon Move It breach. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, sure. Well, no, it's just uh, it's Amazon leaked data in the Move It breach. Just on their who employees. the fuck is still but using it wasn't, Move It? It wasn't customer data. It was just employee data. So there's nothing to see here. Move on. No, 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 no. Uh, what, 2.86 what, who the fuck is still using records. Move It? What? Who the fuck is still using Move It? Well, some threat actor gained a hold of the data and is selling it, basically. Well, and it was a, from what I understand, it was a third party that Amazon used that that was still using Move It, right? Ladies and gentlemen, if you or any of your vendors are still using Move It, you fail. Well, I, I next. Mean, <laughs> but if we didn't use software that had known vulnerabilities or breaches, there'd be no software left to. Yeah, that, to don't use. be using vulnerable Move It. Then you fail. Yeah. Well, no, is no, Move It still use supported? Move it. You I fail. <laughs> So I, I don't know the answer to that question. Is move it still supported? Oh yeah. yeah, it's a who makes move it? I don't know. They make lots of software. <clears throat> I like to. No, no, the move it is made by uh is it progress software? <laughs> the the manufacturer's progress, the package is move it as I understand it. Move it. Move, move it is a it. Yeah, it's made by progress. Fail. Move it. Yeah. In progress, I want to say also, I looked this up. Uh, no, mo- is a suite of Move It uh, software. Okay, I was confused. Like to move it. Move it. Move it. Oh, sorry. 
I know. I got the, now I got the song stuck in my head too. <laughs> Earworm planted. <sighs> well, to, for my story number one, I got uh, you know a notification email from a PR person today. That's how I found out about this merger, and um, Next. I put it up. I put it up there with my comment, <laughs> and I, and I wrote him back and I said. Oh, yeah, we're going to talk about that tonight on our new segment. <laughs> <laughs> Next. <laughs> Next. Um, uh, I, lo- I-, I think we should talk about this later because we need a lot more time, but the, the warrant secret service thing. Yeah. All right, well, let's talk about yeah, that we'll later. later. We'll talk about that later. <clears throat> let's talk about Rick Rolls quick because it's a fun yeah. story. Yeah, All right, do, do Rick Rolls. So this person got uh, an ESP32. They 3D printed a case. Yeah, that looks like a custom 3D yeah printed box. Uh, yeah, it's, or, I mean, and it's 3D printed box. That's you can like... you can find uh, 3D printed cases for ESP 32s and the like uh, oh, yeah. all over the internet. Um, and so they walked around uh, VMware Explore Barcelona 2024. Uh, I'm not sure how many people were there, but he put this um, little uh, piece of code on here that basically. Uh, advertises a Wi-Fi SSID. Uh, I, and I believe the Wi-Fi SSIDs were all strings from the lyrics of the song. Yes. Uh, and then when you connected to that Wi-Fi access point, there was a captive portal that produced an ASCII art <clears throat> image of the Rickroll. I just want to say bravo. Like, bravo. ASCII art for the win. Fun little hacker project. What did he say he got... Uh, Day one, he had 33 connections. Day two, he had 25. And the last day, only five. By the last day, people had figured it out. 63 connections, yeah. Yeah. And he was only logging like their IP addresses or whatever. I thought that was pretty cool. The code is available on GitHub. So you can turn your ESP32 into a Wi-Fi Rick Roller. So he tested it on an ESP32 WRoom 32U. And the code's pretty straight, <clears throat> pretty straightforward. So, like, if you're just getting into into this uh, ESP32 hacking, cool. it's a pretty good place to start. 281 lines of code. Yeah, where's the, and like what, what most is, wait, of that? What, scroll back down. Mm-hmm. What is the uh, ASCII art? And where does that? Oh, play? there's the ASCII art. Oh, so if you connect to it, it gives you a, uh, a captive portal page. You've been recrolled. Correct. It. Correct. But again, and again, yeah, it's 281 lines <clears throat> of code, but the ASCII art and the uh, strings for the Wi-Fi SSID take up a significant number of lines of code, so it's a great place to get started. That's why I added it there. I'm teaching, this, I'm, I'm teaching the wireless class in Amsterdam next week. It might be a fun little thing to put on SP32 and have a bonus challenge for your students. Yeah, connect to it. Larry, yeah. in all seriousness, <laughs> be careful. Of course. Uh, no, you heard about what happened in Amsterdam last week? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Was oh, someone yeah. rickrolling people? No. Oh. <laughs> no. There was a pogrom. It, they, and, then, and it has continued. It is not just one day type of thing that has happened. Yeah. Yes. And it is in central London. It is in central where I will be as well. So, yes. <laughs> I will be careful, my friend. Thank you. I'm sorry. I don't mean to be rude, but just be careful. Yes. Now I'll tell Paul what a pogrom is. How does they he targeted. know that I don't know what a pogrom is? <laughs> Because well, I don't know what it is. <laughs> so you just well, blame that on me. You were like, I know, I know. What it is. I bet you Paul does. I don't blame Paul. So this is not political, but the last mm-hmm. time we had big pogroms was Kristallnacht. Yes. In Germany, mm-hmm. the night of broken glass. Jeff, mm-hmm. I bet you know that one, that word. I do know that one. And so basically these are when people riot and target Jews and try to beat them and kill them. Mm-hmm. So they also target foreigners. So it's, it's interesting, but primarily they target Jews. And in Amsterdam, which is very civilized, you know, the Netherlands are very civilized. It's surprising, but hmm. they have their whack jobs just as we do. Yep. And, and arguably it was at a sporting event featuring. Oh, that. Some, yeah. yeah. That I heard about. That's where it started. It continued out on the streets yes. farther away from the stadium. Yeah. And went over and uh, even went into another day. Uh, where they uh, set fire to a train car, subway car, whatever you want to call it. 
I'll be diligent, my friend. Absolutely. With that, uh, let's take a short break. We're going to come back. We're going to bring Ed Scotus on the show to talk about Holiday Hack Challenge and finish out the news. Stay tuned. 